Thanks for coming, guys. Uh, so yes, I'm Renee. Uh, I work for the Real Junk Food Project. Um, so yes, I'll, I'll tell you a bit about my views on corporate social responsibility, which is uh, very much informed by, I think, practice rather than theory, but hopefully that's useful for you. Uh, it'd be great uh, if anyone has any questions or opinions rather than me just talking for an hour. Do feel free to put up your hand if you've got a question at any point. At the end, it'd be great as well to have just a bit of a discussion. Uh, rather than me and you just listening to my voice for an hour. Uh, so chip in, that'd be great. So just a bit of an idea for what I want to talk about today. So obviously uh, a bit of an introduction to what I think or what I would consider corporate social responsibility. Um, and then having a look at sort of the case study that is uh, the Real Junk Food Project. So we work around the topic of food waste. So I'll tell you a bit more about um, what the problem is with food waste. And then I'll tell you a bit more about what we do about food waste in Sheffield. Um, and then I've got a little example about uh, corporate social responsibility in practice, that it's not about us, but people we work with. Um, and then I'll tell you a bit more about corporate social resp responsibility in our project. Corporate social responsibility. Um, so I think often corporate social responsibility is about sort of sustainable behaviors in, uh, in three areas. It's about social sustainability and having a, a responsible positive impact for people and for communities. It's obviously about the environment, um, but it's also about sustainable and fair practices in terms of how you operate financially. So this is probably relatively common in terms of, uh, if you would look at definitions about uh, corporate social responsibility, I'm sure you'll see a lot of this. What you might not see, and this is really just something I made up, um, is, um, I guess there's sort of, for me, three levels on which people might practice corporate social responsibility. Um, I think the first is probably the most common, it's about giving back, right? So as a, as, a, as a business, you operate maybe fairly ruthlessly, make a lot of money, and at some point you think, actually, let's just maybe also do something worthwhile, as a, sort of a bit of an afterthought, really. Um, then, then the next step sort of above that is, is maybe spending a bit more attention to doing things right in the first place. Maybe that's about paying a real living wage. Maybe that's about not reusing uh, um, a non-recyclable pl product. Or, but at least in the way you operate your business, make sure that the processes that you, that you do, the policy that you have, the materials that you use, that they are sustainable and that they are fair and that they don't contribute negatively to the world around you. And then the third is probably the one that you might not see that often, but for me it's really the most important thing, is it's doing the right thing in the first place. Why have you got a business? What is it trying to do? Is it just trying to make a buck at the expense of other people? And does it really matter if you're using recyclable materials, if you're fleecing other people for money and that's all really that you care about at the end of the day? How responsible is that? So doing the right thing in the first place, having an organisation that actually is trying to make a difference in a positive way, rather than just a buck. For me, it's the ultimate corporate social responsibility. So a bit about food waste. Food waste is a key problem for our planet, our species, our society. The World Economic Forum uh, a year or two ago identified the 10 biggest challenges that face us today, and three of those very directly link to the problem of food waste. Obviously, with a growing population and with increasing inequality, there is a big problem in terms of people's food security. Have they got access to enough food to feed themselves and the right quality of food to feed themselves every day? It links to inclusive growth. You know, when, when our economies grow, does everyone actually benefit from that? Or are we leaving people behind in our quest for increased GDP? And obviously it links to climate change and sustainability, you know, and in particular over the last couple of months, I'm sure because you wouldn't have been able to escape it, you've seen all the articles coming out that our window of opportunity to do something about catastrophic climate change is closing very, very rapidly. And actually, while things like uh, emissions from cars or airplanes or whatever else are very visible ways in which we damage the environment, food waste is a massive contribution to our, our carbon footprint. 
This is not just a problem in third world countries and for other people, this is a problem right here. In Sheffield we waste 400 million pounds worth of food. That's a massive loss in whatever way you look at it. 400 million pounds. That's like about a thousand pounds for every person in Sheffield. It's a lot of money and a lot of food. And at the same time, 40,000 people in Sheffield don't always have enough to eat. And actually these statistics are a bit old, because this is my presentation from last year. Uh, I could have probably updated this, and, and not in a very happy way. One in 14 people, it says here, don't always have enough to eat. Earlier this year, some new statistics came out for the whole of the UK, not specifically for Sheffield, that one in six people in the UK don't always have enough money to buy themselves the, the three meals a day that they need to survive. One in six, right, that's a lot. That's what, like 10 people in this lecture theatre? And that isn't always about people who are, you know, on benefits or whatever else. There is so much hidden poverty and struggle for people to get access to food, even though they're in employment, but maybe they're underemployed or maybe they're very poorly paid. Maybe there's issues with mental or physical health. There's lots of reasons why people don't always have enough to eat. And that's very silly given the amount of food we throw away. Because if you look at the food that we produce, right, so the, the blocks at the top, if that's all the food we produce, then we throw one third of all of that food away, right? So one out of three pigs that we rear, one of them is killed for absolutely no reason and all of that is chucked away. Out of all the th every three loaves of bread we bake, one is thrown in the bin. One in three cabbages we grow, one is thrown in the bin. One third of all the food, right? That's a hell of a lot. So we grow all this food. And then we throw all of this away. And then we don't have enough to feed people. So if you look at how many people we need to feed on the planet, about one in nine people are going hungry on the planet, we only need this, this bit of extra food to feed everybody. It's only a quarter of what we throw away. Right? We can feed everybody, every single person on the planet today, and all we have to do is stop chucking food away for no reason. Now you hear a lot about our problems with population growth and how we're going to feed everybody. We can feed everybody, but our food system is broken. And retailers throw so much away, farms throw so much away, you throw so much away because so many people feel they don't have the time and the skills to do in the kitchen what you need to do with whatever you've got in your fridge and sometimes it's easy to throw it away or get a takeout or buy something else. And we're so disconnected from food that we don't understand anymore when something is still okay to eat even though the packaging might say something else. You know, we throw so much away and we create hunger and there is no reason for it. It's not just a problem about feeding people. So this is a, this is a chart about the carbon footprint of different countries in the world, right? China's got a massive carbon footprint, the US has got a massive carbon footprint. If food waste was a country, it would have the third biggest carbon footprint of any country in the world. Right? Because most of this food we throw away goes to landfill and there where it decomposes enormous amounts of greenhouse gases are released. But it's not just what happens on those landfill sites. Actually, before it gets to the landfill site, we spend so much energy and effort and water and other resources on growing this food, on shipping it halfway around the planet, and all of that's wasted. And all of that together, you're right, yeah. thanks. All of that together adds up to an enormous environmental impact. So we're throwing all this food away, making people go hungry and slowly killing our planet. So maybe a bit more about why all these things are going to waste. There's a lot of reasons for this. Um, some of it is to do with dates on packaging. Is anyone familiar with the differences between best before dates and use by dates and sell by dates? And does anyone want to have a guess? I can see you're not there. Do you want to have a go? Um, use by is when something's got to be eaten by. Uh, best before is like the best quality of the product and sell by is when it's taken off the shelves. Pretty well, yeah, that's very good. So the only date that actually really means anything that you should pay attention to is a use-by date. 
Right, the use by date is the manufacturer saying after this date I do not guarantee that this product is safe to eat. So unless you know a lot about food, it's probably sensible to pay attention to that because you don't want to be risking your health. But all the other dates, best before, display until, sell by, whatever else people have made up, actually means fairly little. It's maybe, as you said, you know, until this date, the manufacturer guarantees that this product is of maximum quality, tastiness, texture, whatever. You know, your biscuit might be a slight bit less crisp after this particular date. But actually, in most cases, you can't tell the difference. If you have dates on the bottom of your cans, you know, tin of soup or something like that, it means absolutely nothing. Because the whole idea of the canning process was that when you would chuck this in your basement for several decades and war would break out or whatever else would happen, you would have food and it would be good to eat. Tins don't go off, and unless tins are damaged. There is nothing that changes inside that can. And so lots of these dates, actually, they're just batch numbers because manufacturers have, are legally required to be able to recall product. And so they do that by saying, oh, you know, this, this batch with this date on it, that's a batch I want back because something went wrong and someone left a bit of cleaning product in the machine or something like that. It doesn't mean anything about the quality of food. But there's lots of other reasons. Logistics is a big reason. So obviously businesses are constantly optimizing their costs so that they can increase their margins. And so there's lots of points in the supply chain where dealing with food by shipping it around in a car, by storing it for a bit longer in a warehouse, by having someone sort it into stock, those are all very expensive things to do. Because warehouses are expensive, vehicles are expensive, stuff is expensive, and actually food is artificially fairly cheap. So there are lots of points in the supply chain where actually dealing with food doesn't really make sense financially. So for instance, if you order your shopping online and you're not in to take your delivery for whatever reason, you might think that, that all that food goes back to the distribution hub, back to a warehouse, gets sorted back into stock for then to go out some other time. Actually often it doesn't, because from a financial point of view, it's much cheaper to insure yourself against your customer not being in throw all of it away and claim it on insurance. So that's what happens sometimes. In fact, that's what happens quite a lot. There's lots of other reasons. We're very disconnected from you know, our, our food and our skills in the kitchen and our willingness to spend a bit of time to prepare the food that we eat and keeps us alive has diminished a lot. Um, and there are a lot of issues around huh, marketing. <laughs> um, you know, we, this idea that we need to walk into a store on a Saturday, five minutes to five, and still have fully stacked shelves because they look pretty. Or that we need big displays before Christmas or before Halloween with all this food that people aren't necessarily all going to buy, but it creates an atmosphere in the store. And after Halloween, all of the pumpkins get thrown away. And after Christmas, all the Christmas puddings and all the other things that were, the displays were made up of get thrown away. Or the bread that was baked in the store to make it smell nicely of bread, make you hungry and make you buy more. That's the reason the, the bread is baked in store. It's a marketing ploy to make you buy more. And if you buy bread, that's great. But if you don't, it's not the point. We will throw it away. It's a marketing prop. So that's something we want to do something about. And that's why we started the Real Junk Food Project. Um, although we are now rebranding to Foodworks because it's shorter. So this is how we look at the problem of food waste. And actually you can probably apply this to any sort of waste. There's a hierarchy of stuff that you need to do to make sure that you waste less. And actually it'd be good to have a quick look at that because you can do some of these things. And it'd be great actually for today that you don't maybe just take away something that you can apply to your studies, but maybe you can apply some of it as well to you being a better citizen and wasting a bit less at home. So the top two really are about you. Buy only what you can use, you know, all the two for one offers and stuff like that. It's very tempting, but often we end up throwing half of it away. Buy the things you know you can use. That's where it all starts. Use what you have. You know, when you open your fridge and there's something in there and you don't quite fancy it or you know, don't know what to do with it, maybe make a bit more effort to use it rather than throwing it away or do something else. But that's not really what we're focusing on as a project. What we're focusing on as a project are the three in the middle. Share what you can't use, then feeding animals, and then recycling. 
So we're a redistribution organization in a lot of ways. We pick up food in Sheffield every day and we find somewhere for it to go that it makes a positive impact. So this is Joe. Joe started a project in Sheffield inspired by a similar project that was founded in Leeds a bit before us by Adam. We started about three and a half years ago. First just having some pop-ups, then with a permanent cafe, but very quickly this issue of food waste sort of overtook, <laughs> overtook us and we've been doubling in size every three to six months for the past three and a half years. So uh, we started out with food in our living room, uh, we very quickly needed a warehouse which we got in October. Um, we started an education program with primary schools later in the year, then built a catering business and now we do surplus boxes like a veg box. So um, our community cafes. So we pick up about a ton of food every day, like a literal ton, a thousand kilos of food every day, six tons a week. And one of the things we do with this food is we cook with it. So we have two cafes in Sheffield, one's in Zest in Upperthorpe, and the other one is behind the Park Hill Flats, not too far from here, in an old Methodist church. And we take all the ingredients that we pick up, we cook fresh meals with them, and we make them available on a pay as you feel basis. Has everyone heard, anyone heard of pay as you feel? Put your hand up if you have. Not so very hard for me to see. <laughs> Who said a pay as you feel? You have. Right? You were nodding? Yeah. Come on, you can you use that arm, you can do it. I've got faith in you. Very good. All right. I'm not going to ask you a follow-up question, don't worry. So pay as you feel means that we ask people to pay whatever they think this meal is worth. And what that means to them might depend very much on how good the meal was, but also maybe on their personal circumstances. What are their financial circumstances, maybe today or maybe in general? There's lots of ways in which you can build a reciprocal relationship. So patient feels our way of saying, look, we have food here and we want you to value it. We're not giving it away for free because whatever the possible reasons might have been that this food was thrown away, underneath that was always the failure of someone to value this food enough not to throw it away. So we don't give anything away for free. So this food is value, but how you value it is completely up to you. Give us some money, that's great. Help us pay the bills, maybe come and help out. Maybe exchange it for something else that you've made or that you have or that you've done. It doesn't matter, but we can find a way to respectfully find an exchange. So that means our cafes are great places to bring communities together because we get people from all walks of life. We do feed people that are really struggling because they might be sanctioned on their benefits, they might be homeless, they might be struggling with substance abuse or whatever the issue is. But we, are, we don't just create special places for poor people where they can be safely away from society when we don't have to worry about them and we don't have to see them and where they can just be with people like them and we create spaces where everyone can come together where everyone can enjoy the same meal and be treated with the same respect and make the same choices about how they pay back and so our spaces have literally every type of person in there, every race, every religion, every economic background. And that also means that it is a great way to build some more understanding because it's very easy. There's a lot of, you know, a lot of uh, segregation today in society and people finding it really hard to accept people from different walks of lives. Um, but it's actually often a lot harder to maintain those attitudes if you've got a person right in front of you rather than just the statistics or a label in an article. So hopefully, other than serving some nice meals and reducing food waste, our cafes are also a way to bring people together. So very quickly after our first cafe, we needed a, a, a bigger vehicle than my VW Polo. So uh, in January 16, we got this electric vehicle. And again, this is about not just doing the right thing, but it's also about making sure you do things in the right way because there's no point us driving around with big old diesel vehicles trying to save the environment while steaming up the city with our fumes. So the electric vehicle makes sense. In our warehouse, we also run a market. So we've got lots of different places where this food might go and I'll tell you a bit more about that later as well. Um, but at the end of the day, I always have food left over. And so all this food goes to a market. Every single day we stock up a market with any food that I haven't found a destination for and we invite people in 
to come and do a shop and pay whatever they can afford. So every day we feed between 40 and 60 people, six days a week, so that's 300 people every week. That's more than the largest food bank in the UK. Not that we're a food bank, but just to put it in perspective. So this is a bit about our schools program. I apologize for the face. So at the moment we've got 15 schools, the video's a bit older. Um, because ultimately, we, I don't want to be doing this for the next 20 years. You know, picking up food and, and, and bringing it somewhere else, finding someone to eat it, it's all great, but it's not solving a problem, it's mitigating a problem. So we're working with primary schools in Sheffield to change people's attitudes to food, to reintroduce the kids to fresh produce and for them to understand what, you know, what a mango is or what a broccoli is and where it comes from. Because so many kids, if you ask where their food comes from, they, it comes from a shelf in a store and then what happens before that very few of them actually know. So we're feeding lots of families healthy food uh, through running a market stall in schools. Kids run the market stall, so it's a great way for them to learn because they get very excited about playing shop. Um, so that's one of the other things we do with our food. But there's more. We do catering. Um, so you might not really uh, associate surplus and waste food with this, but we cater for any possible event that you can imagine. This year we've done about 10 weddings, so this is 100 to 200 guests, three course plated meals on location, all without buying a single ingredient, all from leftovers. And this is not second class food, you let the guests who, often, often um, couples don't tell guests that, that we're catering for them, it's like a big reveal at the end, and mostly people have never noticed that they've had food that was rescued from going to the bin. Now this food is still perfectly fine and the quantities and the quality that we get it in allows us to do stuff like that. Last year we, we catered for Dogfest, which is a big uh, film festival in Sheffield. We fed 400 volunteers every lunchtime for a week, just from surplus. And that's alongside working with 15 schools, that's alongside running two cafes. That's how much food is going to waste. And that is only 0.1% of the food we waste in Sheffield. So our impact is really quite dramatical. This is uh, a graphic from last summer. Uh, so to date, I can give you some more up-to-date numbers. To date, we have saved about 350 tons of food. 350 tons. We fed more than 100,000 meals to people. And if you look at our carbon footprint, it's the same of uh, the car our carbon footprint is the same as a forest of 30,000 trees. So we're a carbon negative business. We save the same amount of carbon as is sequestered by a forest of 30,000 trees. So a bit about CSR in practice. So this is an article from last year. Um, and this is probably, I think, fairly typical of you know, if you, if you uh, look up case studies of uh, corporate social responsibility, this is probably the sort of thing that you'll see. Asta and Fairshare and the Trussell Trust launched 20 million partnership to tackle food insecurity. And that sounds great, right? How wonderful that Asta is putting in this much money to work with Fairshare and the Trussell Trust to tackle food insecurity. Or is it? Because at the same time, Walmart, the company owns Asta, are responsible for such an enormous amount of working poverty because they refuse to pay their staff a decent wage. So they are causing food insecurity on a massive scale and profiting from it. And then they're claiming credit for putting a tiny bit of that money back into food banks so that their staff can go and have some food. So it's all great to look good, but is this really being responsible or is it really just a fig leaf for all the irresponsible practices that you're operating on a daily basis. So I think a lot of commercial traditional companies have a very narrow view of corporate social responsibility. Corporate social responsibility is, is a PR problem. It's not about doing things right or doing the right thing. It's about looking good. And that is actually not very responsible. So my view on corporate social responsibility links very much to social enterprising. Put your hand up if you're familiar with the term social enterprising. Don't worry, and I won't ask a question, it just means 
I go on for a bit longer or I won't. Put your hand up. Anyone? All right, so social enterprising. I think I've got something here. There we go. A social enterprise is an organization that applies commercial strategies to maximize improvements in financial, social, and environmental well-being. Right, so this is not a business that is trying to make up for what they've done wrong. This is not a business that is trying to make money, but at least trying to do the least possible damage along the way. Social enterprises are businesses that are set up so that they can do something worthwhile in the first place. So that's not corporate social responsibility as an afterthought. That's corporate social responsibility as the basis for designing your company. So we're a social enterprise. And so this is what it roughly looks like for us. So obviously our env environmental sustainability is fairly obvious. We save lots of food, we are carbon negative, we have a very positive impact on the environment. We've got a fantastic social impact, we're bringing people together in our cafes, we're providing opportunities to employment for our volunteers, and our financial sustainability uh, in terms of, and, and our financial responsibility to our customers, pay should feel is a good example of that. You know, we've provided an ability for people to, irrespective of their financial circumstances, to be our customer and to, like anyone else, take part in a normal social sort of process. We try and do things in the right way. The electric vehicle is an example. You know, we pick up this food and we save it from the bin. And while we're doing that, let's make sure that we don't make things worse by driving a diesel vehicle around. We offer volunteers routes to employment, but also as a business, we're not, we're not a charity. You know, we might be doing things that people often associate with being charitable, but that's actually something that we would definitely not associate with. We are a business. We're non for profit, but we are a business. And that means we sustain ourselves financially. Because for us, that is also part of being responsible. Putting your hand out for other people to provide you with money so you can do the things that you want to do isn't necessarily responsible. We pay our own way. So, so when I look at corporate resp social responsibility in our business, really there is no corporate social responsibility po uh, uh, policy for us. Because those policies are often about giving back. And my view really is that I have nothing to give back because I didn't take anything away in the first place. So at the moment, we've been around for three and a half years. We've done a lot of things, but as I said, it's actually in some ways really very small. Uh, we're doing six tons of food a week at the moment, but it's only 0.1% of all the food that we waste in Sheffield. More needs to be done, and we only have a couple of years really to get this right. So at the moment, we are also crowdfunding to scale up, Feel free to make a donation. Um, that's what this video is about, but it's also a great video to tell you a bit more about where we are as a project and where we've come from and where we think we're going. So I thought I'd play it. So that's us. Um, so before, hopefully, maybe there's a couple of questions on opportunity to have a discussion. Um, what I would really like is, in terms of your futures as marketeers or whatever you might end up doing in a business. You know, we, we all, you as a person and the business you're working for, we all have a responsibility as citizens of this city, this country, this world, right? And this world will only continue to be a worthwhile world to live in if we all take that responsibility. Not as an afterthought, but as a basis for everything that we do. And so wherever you end up going after your studies here, I hope that's something that you remember. And that wherever you end up, that you think about how, as a person or as a business, can we do the right thing? How can we not just not do damage, but how can we actually make this world a tiny bit better? And you can make a buck out of making the world a tiny bit better. There's nothing wrong with that. But try and at least start with making the world a tiny bit better.